Um, so another old friend and a, and, a, and a great scientist, Richard Somerville, who is uh, now a distinguished uh, uh, professor emeritus at uh, the Scripps Institution of Oceanography and the University of California in San Diego, will give the, what is going to become the Arrhenius Lecture, uh, which uh, if you don't know who Arrhenius is, I do recommend you please read about the work that that great chemist did in uh, early studies of uh, uh, the potential for something to happen to the climate system. Richard uh, has many, many accomplishments for his studies of clouds and, and other climate processes. Um, he's also known for uh, um, you know, many, many research papers and, and, and his book, The Forgiving Air, Understanding Environmental Change, for one he won a special award from the American Meteorological Society, the Louis Baton Author Award. He's also, uh, through AMS, was the Walter Earl Roberts uh, lectureship um, uh, awarded for that. Uh, he's a fellow of the American Meteorological Society, the American Association of Advancement of Science, and unfortunately is not a, a fellow of AGU, That's, which is something we need to correct. Uh, somehow, a lack of foresight on our part. Um, he's also been a coordinating lead author with IPCC and therefore uh, shares in the um, 2007 Nobel Peace Prize. Um, many, many other accomplishments, and it's, so it's really great to have uh, Richard here. And what he's going to do today is, is talk about John Tyndall and the, uh, the pioneering role that he played in, in climate science. Um, very important, and it's, it's good to have that recognized. So its title is John Tyndall, His Pioneering Contributions to Climate Science and Scientific Outreach. It's great to have uh, Richard here to, to, to make this presentation. It's all yours. Thanks very much, Don. Thanks to all of you for coming. I'm going to spend the next uh, 35 or 45 minutes talking to you about someone who's not well known, but who in his day, 150 years ago, was a great climate scientist and a superb charismatic science communicator. And we're talking about John Tyndall this year because it's the 150th anniversary of a publication of his that I'll discuss in some detail later on, Tyndall did the first empirical work demonstrating the reality of the greenhouse effect. Before Tyndall, it was the subject of uh, scientific speculation, of considerable theorizing, including uh, work by very eminent scientists, notably Fourier. But if you go back and read what Fourier wrote, much of which is translated, but some of which is still available only in French. If you look at that, you will realize that in that time, in the early 1800s, scientists were groping with uh, things we take for granted knowing today, such as, is the uh, heat balance of the Earth uh, influenced strongly by the natural greenhouse effect? Does the heat we receive from radiation from stars matter? And there was a great deal of conjecture, plus this was a brand new subject. It's hard to realize today, but infrared radiation had been discovered only by Herschel, the astronomer, in 1800. And so by early in the, in the century, it was still mysterious and poorly understood, much you might think in the way that dark matter is today. And Tyndall broke through this fog of uncertainty and ignorance and put greenhouse gases in the laboratory and shine, shone infrared beams on them and measured their absorption of infrared energy. And the story of how he came to do that is an extraordinary one, and I've been digging in it uh, for a year and a half now, and I want to tell you a little bit about this person who is still, I think, very poorly known. Uh, Tyndall, as you can see, um, looks uh, stern and serious. And there, I'm going to show you a great number of pictures of Tyndall. And 
he doesn't change from youth to middle age to old age. The expression is very much the same. He's dead serious. He looks you straight in the eye, and his beard changes. It gets whiter as he gets older. The biographical details are interesting. <clears throat> Tyndall was born in a little town in Western Ireland that looks to American ears like Leyland Bridge, but is actually pronounced Lachlan Bridge. His uh, family was of very modest circumstances. They'd come over to Ireland uh, from uh, England in the 17th century, as you can read there, from Gloucestershire. His uh, father was not wealthy. The whole family had very modest means. His father was uh, a policeman as well as a shoemaker. But he was extremely influential on young Tyndall. He was a lover of, uh, of intellectual debate. He was passionate about knowledge. He was largely self-schooled. Uh, and throughout Tyndall's life, he, you could see clearly the influence of his uh, father. His father was also argumentative, we've learned. And so was John Tyndall. His father died in 1847 in the Great Famine uh, in Ireland. But young John Tyndall, largely because of his father's influence, we, we are, are assured, stayed in school until the relatively late age of 17, which was unusual for a child in uh, modest circumstances in those days. They would have typically left school earlier and, uh, and gone to work. He came out of uh, uh, school, and his first job was as a surveyor for the organization called the Irish Ordnance uh, Survey. He worked hard at it. Tyndall, in the slightest acquaintanceship with the facts of his life, will tell you Tyndall was a world-class workaholic. He worked hard all his life. He worked hard at everything. He was largely an autodidact, self-taught uh, like his father. He worked hard at this surveying job, which, as you can see, was not an attractive job, long hours, low pay, hard work. And he transferred <coughs> uh, shortly afterwards to the English uh, survey, a similar organization but in England rather than, than Ireland. Tyndall had a tough time uh, as a young man working in England. Um, he was uh, canned from the English survey. He wasn't an easy person uh, there. He complained about the way that uh, young Irish workers like himself were mistreated. He didn't like the administration of the English survey. And he went back to Ireland. He went back to his hometown, Lachlan Bridge, without any money, um, very uh, discouraged and uh, <clears throat> with poor prospects. He was hired, as you can see, to go back to England due to the railway mania. There was an urgent need, as railroads were rapidly expanding in England at that time, for sur surveyors. And he worked there on that project for three years until he could see that also running out. And so he basically gave up surveying, and the next job he tried was teaching uh, math at a college in Hampshire. The college, um, and it's a high school in present-day uh, American language, was what we would call today, I think, a progressive school or an experimental school. Some charter schools in the US today uh, are reminiscent of Queenwood College. It was uh, innovative. And Tyndall at this college, teaching math for the first time, remember he was a person without a university education himself, uh, demonstrated what would be a lifelong talent for finding uh, good friends, making good friends, and keeping the friendships for a long time. And the first uh, friend there that comes into his life with whom he interacted for a long time was Edward Franklin. And they decided to teach each other what they knew. Franklin was a chemist. And Tyndall and Franklin basically made a deal, I'll teach you chemistry if you teach uh, me some math. And they, they did it, and not at all in an amateurish or dilettantish way. They would get up at 5 o'clock in the morning and hammer on this, advancing their own education. And by 1848, remember Tyndall was born in, in 1820, so he was still shy of 30 years old. By 1848, they had decided to go to Germany uh, for further training. That was an audacious decision. They decided to go to a first-rate uh, German school to study physics and math and get a PhD. They didn't know very much physics or math. They didn't have a college degree. They didn't have any money to speak of, and they didn't speak German. 
But they set off. Here's a picture of Tyndall to illustrate my point that very little changes in his appearance from time to time. You see, it's a younger beard. This must have been at about that time. And the details of how this ar was arranged are a little bit obscure. It looks like Tyndall uh, took loans from friends to finance this operation. But they went to Germany and uh, were welcomed by a scientist whose name is familiar to every American, Robert Bunsen, of the Bunsen burner uh, fame. And Bunsen, as you could see, uh, is only a little bit older than Tyndall, uh, but he was a professor in a university which then and now is a first-rate university in Marburg. And uh, <clears throat> Bunsen, born in 1811, Tyndall recall in 1820, welcomed them. He made room for them in uh, his lab. And Bunsen was an inspiring lecturer. He, uh, I'm not listing his achievements there, but as you can see, he discovered uh, two chemical elements. He worked on emission spectra, closely related topic to the one that Tyndall would later become famous for. But uh, Bunsen was a dedicated, crystal clear, gifted uh, physics lecturer. Tyndall later said he learned German by listening to Robert Bunsen lecture. Bunsen turned out not to be his thesis advisor. Tyndall looked at, uh, at other uh, uh, prospects. He had uh, other tentative advisors. He ended up uh, working with Knobloch for a while. I've looked at his PhD thesis. It's what you would call today a uh, abstract, formal, mathematical description of screw surfaces. And Tyndall labored over the math. We know he, he wrote constantly all his life. He wrote lots of letters. He kept diaries. So you can, you can agonize along with him as Kindle worked his way, Tyndall worked his way through calculus, for example. But he worked hard, and it's hard to believe in today's world where PhDs take longer, but he finished a PhD in essentially applied mathematics at Marburg uh, within two years. After that, Tyndall stayed in Europe for a while. Uh, he went to France. He spent time in Germany. Uh, he made friends. He had a lifelong talent, as I've said, for making friends. He impressed a lot of people. He was a bright guy. He was hardworking. And then he returned to England and, uh, <clears throat> in 1851, so he was a little bit beyond 30 at that point, and applied for jobs in several places and got turned down everywhere. He went back to Queenwood College and uh, did translations from the German, which uh, he had picked up along the way and uh, applied for jobs, as you can see, in Toronto, in Sydney, and in Ireland at Cork and Galway, but uh, got turned down for all of them. He had found out that, as he later wrote, uh, science was wonderful and exciting, but it didn't necessarily put food on the table. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, he was uh, nonetheless impressing people in, uh, in England. And he got elected to the Royal Society, which then as now uh, was an uh, eminent uh, organization, equivalent roughly to the National Academy of Sciences in the US. At a very young age, still in his early 30s, in 1852. And then a magical moment appeared. The road forked for Tyndall on the evening of the 11th of February, 1853. He had been invited to give one of the Royal Institution's um, famous public lectures. The Royal Institution uh, is something we don't have any counterpart of in, in this country, but at this time, in the middle 1800s in England, the Royal Institution of Great Britain, which uh, is located in London, was famous both as a place where first-rate science was done and as a place which was dedicated to public outreach, to communicating science, so that the same scientists who were doing world-class research were also giving public lectures. And these are lectures to which the cream of London society came. So it was uh, the equivalent, if you like, of uh, a modern uh, television series explaining science or of a modern documentary film uh, dramatizing science. And it was widely attended. And it was these twin missions of research and outreach were considered of, of equal importance. And uh, <clears throat> Tyndall was obsessive in preparing talks, in preparing demonstrations for general audiences throughout his life. He loved doing it. He was good at it. He was a charismatic lecturer, and he slaved over it. There are enormous stories. I'll tell you a few of them 
as we go along. So the first lecture he gave, just because he had met people in London, they'd heard good things about him from their colleagues on the continent, Tyndall was given his chance to give a public lecture. And in the audience, and very impressed by Tyndall's performance, was one of the true superstars of uh, mid-19th century British science, Michael Faraday. This is the lecture room at the Royal Institution at that time, and that's Michael Faraday. And uh, for people here who aren't familiar with Faraday, it's a little bit hard to convey the uh, stature that he held in British science at that time. He was a little bit like Tyndall. He wasn't especially mathematical, but he had enormously strong, gifted physical insight. And he was, in the opinion of many knowledgeable historians of science, the greatest experimentalist ever. It was his discoveries, including electromagnetic induction, for example, that later formed the empirical basis for the mathematical theories of James Clerk Maxwell, for example. Faraday was a world-class experimental physicist. As an anecdote, Einstein kept three portraits, three pictures in his study of three scientists he admired. One was Isaac Newton, one was Maxwell, and the third was Faraday. And Faraday, who at that time was the head, director and superintendent of the Royal Institution of Great Britain, was greatly taken uh, with Tyndall. So it's like the story you occasionally hear today. A promising young scientist gives a terrific job talk and gets a position as a result of it. Tyndall, after making this great first impression, was invited back. He gave more uh, lectures in the public lecture forum of the Royal Institution, and he was offered a position there in 1853 and elected as professor of natural philosophy. The word physics and physicist were very new at that time. Tyndall was one of the first scientists in the English-speaking world to call himself a physicist, but uh, <clears throat> natural philosophy was uh, the general title, and uh, that was his professor title, and he turned down other offers the salary was rather modest. I haven't tried to convert it to modern units, but it was 200 pounds, I think roughly twice what a, a street cop on the beat was making at that time. And uh, he was making roughly that amount of money at Queenwood, at this uh, experimental high school. But despite the uh, low salary, which he complained about later, Tyndall was never uh, shy about making his views known. He got it raised later on after they found out that he and the Royal Institution were a great match. But despite uh, the low salary, he elected to stay there. It was, as I said, a perfect showcase for his talents, both as a researcher and as a communicator. And furthermore, he had the chance to work with, with Faraday, one of the truly eminent uh, scientists of that time. So Tyndall stayed at the Royal Institution essentially for his whole career, for 34 years, as a, as a researcher and as a communicator. I have a picture of Tyndall of this, at the same stage. If I go back, you can see, again, the Faraday with this uh, lecture uh, counter in front of him with a space hollowed out for him to stand in. And if I look ahead, here's Tyndall at the, clearly the same thing. This is not as high quality a picture, but it shows uh, Tyndall holding forth there. And there are wonderful stories of uh, some of Tyndall's performances as a lecturer. He, uh, for example, a young woman once was visiting the Royal Institution and uh, saw a lithe young man leaping over a counter and catching a flask of water just before it fell on the ground. And later she went to the public lecture that night. The lecturer was the same lithe young man who was Tyndall, and at one moment he leaped over the counter and caught a flask of water, and he'd just been rehearsing that little bit of stagecraft earlier on. You know, you have to think back. There wasn't any, we, we, haven't, we can't see the lectures. There weren't, wasn't any video recording then. But uh, we hear some of the things that Tyndall did. So for example, in that time, before electronics, before uh, hi-fi and stereo systems, and <clears throat> you had to be in the room where music was being played in order to hear it. And Tyndall devised the following stratagem. In the basement below this room where he was lecturing, he had a grand piano placed and a person playing piano on it. And then he had a wooden stick, a long pole, and a hole drilled in the floor of the room where he was, down to the room where the piano was. He stuck the stick down through the hole, so the bottom of the stick rested on the sounding board of the piano. The top of the stick 
uh, came up through the floor and he put the peg of a cello on the stick. And suddenly the people in this room here could hear the sounds of a, of a grand piano being played because it was picking up the vibrations from the piano downstairs. He had an extraordinary facility and creativity in devising uh, demonstrations like that and uh, also in thinking of clever ways to talk about things. For example, he had figured out that it was scattering from small particles that uh, caused the sky to be blue. It's, Rayleigh did the mathematics later on, but uh, Tyndall's way of expressing that to his audience was to say that when I look into the blue eyes of a beautiful woman, I have to think it's those little particles in that muddy solution reflecting and making him blue. <laughs> So this summarizes a little bit Tyndall's uh, talents there. Incidentally, he was a prolific author, and he wrote a lot of articles and a number of best-selling books that were based on his lectures, and they sold widely and made him wealthy. So I know most of you didn't go into science in order to get rich, but sometimes it happens, and it happened in Tyndall's uh, <coughs> case. He ranked with Faraday, who was equally talented. They were very different people, by the way, as I've said, they were in many ways similar in their research approach, gifted experimenters, profound insight, great uh, ability to pick on important questions to work, not especially mathematical. They didn't rank with the Maxwells and the Rayleighs of that time mathematically. But as communicators, they were great. I've guessed here that Carl Sagan, who was a great um, scientist as well as a, as a TV megastar, uh, would, might, might be a modern counterpart. And Jacques Cousteau, who was not a scientist and who never called himself a scientist, but who was a French explorer and inventor and filmmaker, and who probably is more responsible than anyone else for the degree to which the general public today understands and appreciates something about the ocean, might be modern counterparts uh, for John Tyndall in England in the 1800s. Tyndall was uh, not uh, just a hopeless geek. He was a man. He liked women. He, proposed marriage unsuccessfully, and he did get married in midlife, late life for the 1800s. He was married to Louisa Hamilton, who was 25 years younger than he was. They didn't have children, uh, but uh, they had a very um, happy marriage. At, uh, Tyndall was uh, brutally frank, and as I've said, he wrote incessantly, so he wrote a letter uh, to a family member saying that his wife-to-be was not wealthy nor handsome, but they would be very handsome together, very happy together, and they were. Tyndall also at this stage of his life became an avid uh, vacationer in the Swiss Alps and an avid mountaineer. This was the age of heroic mountaineering exploits. Tyndall was almost the first person to uh, climb the Matterhorn, and he was the first to climb it in the other direction, the uncommon direction, and he has several other first ascents. This was in the days, days when people would simply set off with a, a hiking staff and a sandwich and go conquer a mountain. And uh, he was madly in love with the Alps. He was uh, courageous to the point of being uh, foolhardy. He built a vacation house uh, in the Alps, and uh, Louisa, his wife, went with him, and they had uh, <clears throat> many, many happy times there. He also worked on alpine problems, such as movements of glaciers, for example. He uh, suffered from various kinds of ill health all his life, gout and asthma and uh, insomnia, for example. And uh, he resigned from uh, the uh, Royal Institution in Great Britain in 1887, as you can see there, and six years later uh, died tragically from an overdose. He took several drugs, and his wife mixed up the doses and uh, inadvertently poisoned him. Quite innocent. Uh, uh, accident, but tragic. By that time, however, Tyndall was in poor health and his scientific career was uh, well beyond him, well behind him. I have another picture. You see what I mean? He doesn't change very much. Tyndall's research interests were very broad, and I'm going to tell you about the one that uh, we're celebrating the anniversary of this year, but in addition to this work on the, the greenhouse effect or the absorption of infrared radiation by gases. Uh, as you can see there, he, he worked on, uh, on glacier motion. I've mentioned light diffusion, the germ theory of disease. He corresponded with Pasteur, for example. Diamagnetism, which had been a main interest of, of Faraday's, received many, many uh, 
honors and eventually succeeded Faraday as the head of the, of the institution. Now, I'm going to say this tactfully, but, um, ah, sorry, I'll let you read that one. Tyndall was um, combative, I think is a good, a good term. He enjoyed a good intellectual uh, fight. Um, and I like this quote here, not just the keen controversialist one, but the very model of an Irishman, wild, athletic, a hard worker, and a fluent talker. Uh, he was probably an agnostic, unlike Faraday, by the way, who was deeply religious and belonged to a, uh, a very strict uh, fundamentalist, you might say in current terms, sect. Uh, Tyndall was likely an, an agnostic. He came into, uh, into conflict with the church of that time because he was an ardent supporter of uh, Darwin and of evolution, and he was a good friend of Huxley, who was, uh, as you know, a publicist and also an ardent supporter of, uh, of Darwin. And uh, in political terms, um, Tyndall was a unionist. That is to say, he was a person who favored a continued relationship between the governments of uh, England and Ireland. So he was strongly opposed by those in Ireland who favored Irish independence. And in fact, Tyndall was not well appreciated uh, in Ireland at that time. And as I said, he had tried unsuccessfully for university appointments there. And a lot of people in Ireland didn't care for Tyndall, either because of his politics or his religion or his personal character, all three. And even today, I found uh, in Ireland that uh, where there was a conference this fall in memory, in celebration of this 150th anniversary of his great discovery, I found that uh, you could still uh, easily dig up people for whom uh, Tyndall was uh, was not a well-regarded scientist or citizen. I've said here that he was generous. That's an interesting story there. Tyndall had a highly successful lecture tour in the United States. He made a lot of money, and he gave it away. He put in, in trust with a group of American academics. It was in the 1870s. And, uh, and they used it to uh, fund, at his request, young promising science students to go to Germany to study. Tyndall had a low opinion of the educational system at that time in England and Ireland and the United States, and he advocated serious uh, would-be physicists should ought to go to Germany and do what he had done, take a German degree. And in fact, you can find today Nobel laureates who were Tyndall scholars supported by the proceeds of this endowment, which came from him simply giving away the proceeds of his extremely successful American a lecture tour. Okay, now for a little bit of science. This is um, not a schematic diagram. It's a, almost a, a photographic sketch of the apparatus that Tyndall constructed to uh, make his discovery about uh, greenhouse gases absorbing uh, IR. The, this is a brass tube here, a little over a meter long, about four feet long, and that was the working tube. And a lot of this stuff down here is just uh, pumps and refrigeration and uh, hoses for putting gases into and out of this brass tube. The infrared radiation uh, came uh, from a source over here on the right-hand side, which was a cube containing um, a boiling, boiling water. There's a little Bunsen burner under there that some of you may see. And so the, the IR beam went through a uh, a rock salt panel here, which let infrared radiation pass but didn't let the gas escape. And this gadget here was a thermopile, essentially a bunch of, of uh, thermocouples that converted a temperature difference um, to an electric current. And <clears throat> what Tyndall had devised was a kind of differential uh, thermopile. So he had another heat source here, and he would evacuate the tube and then move this little screen here, which partially transparent to IR, which could be moved through small distances through a thumb screw here. And by moving the position of the screen, he could alter the amount of, of IR from this left-hand source that fell on this left cone of the thermopile until it exactly balanced the stuff coming in from the right cone. So he'd evacuate this first, so you have a vacuum in the tube, and then uh, adjust the screen until the balance was zero. This was a galvanometer, which was the ammeter of the day. And so when these currents exactly balanced, the needle was zero. 
Then he would, uh, <coughs> without touching anything else, put uh, the gas in question. Carbon dioxide was one he measured. Water vapor was another. Several common gases, including nitrogen and oxygen, the gases that make up most of the atmosphere, which are essentially transparent to IR. So fill the tube, say, with CO2, and then the amount of uh, energy here would be uh, re reduced because the CO2 would be absorbing some of it, and that would move the needle. The system was so uh, sensitive uh, that uh, if, he, if he or his laboratory assistant stood near it, the heat they were radiating, you know, people give off roughly 100 watts in the IR, uh, <clears throat> would move the uh, ammeter needle, the galvanometer needle, too. So he instead observed it uh, from the other side of the room. The first few pages of the paper that he published in 1861 are uh, filled with details of how he built this apparatus, how hard it was to get copper wire that was completely non-magnetic, to get rock salt of the appropriate quantity, quality and so on. He built the instrument himself, and it's clear that he spent a great deal of time um, making a satisfactory one. He also traveled with this instrument. He took it on lecture tours. And I've seen it. It was in, the, uh, the, in Dublin for the conference this September. It turns out the curators from, from the Royal Institution, which is still going strong in London, said that when Tyndall retired and somebody else took over as director, the usual procedure was to get rid of the predecessor's stuff by packing it into boxes and putting them in a closet. And so it had sat in a closet, and it was easy for them to dig it up. So this was the gadget. And, uh, Tyndall's research with it clearly showed that uh, these gases that uh, were innocuous gases, you know, carbon dioxide is tasteless and odorless and colorless. It's the bubbles in beer and Coke and champagne, but it does absorb in the infrared. And Tyndall immediately realized the significance of this discovery. He said, he wrote somewhere, and I may have it uh, on the slide, Let's see, I'm, I'm ahead of the slides here, but here he says, such changes in fact, that is changes in the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, may have produced all the mutations of climate which the researchers, researchers of geologists reveal. Tyndall had written somewhere that uh, without CO2 um, and water vapor, the earth would be, quote, held fast in the iron grip of frost. He understood immediately that changes in the concentrations of greenhouse gases could have a very large uh, effect on climate. And I think these, these quotes today appear prescient. This paper came out in 1861, for example, before we knew anything about uh, <clears throat> whether CO2 amounts were changing, before any work had been done that would quantitatively relate CO2 concentrations uh, to climate, and yet Tyndall intuited that these changes might be large enough. And he became interested in them um, as possible causes of ice ages. And of course, we know today that the transitions between glacial and interglacial periods are in fact paced by changes in the Earth's orbit, the Milankovitch mechanism, but that they're amplified by CO2 changes. That so as the world warms and comes out of a glacial period, we know now that <laughs> sometime later, several centuries later, typically, the CO2 amount in the atmosphere rises likely is coming mainly from the ocean. And then that CO2 addition to the atmosphere augments the warming that had been triggered uh, by the orbital parameter changes. And a rough present day quantitative estimate is that the CO2 augmentation, this positive feedback, if you like, or vicious cycle, is responsible for something like 30% of the, of the change so that you don't get without the CO2 changes uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the effect of uh, of the climate changes due to the orbital parameters alone. So it's one of the first empirical demonstrations that, in fact, climate does depend sensitively on carbon dioxide. OK. I want to say a few words about something that happened after Tyndall. Svante Arrhenius, who won a Nobel Prize a few years later in chemistry, did what is really the first modern theoretical work. And Arrhenius was no slouch. He, if you reread his paper today, it looks incredibly modern. He, for example, understood the water vapor feedback. He realized that as the world warmed, 
the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere would increase. He did very detailed calculations. He knew that the increase in water vapor would significantly increase the warming. And he came up with a, I would say, as a combination of, of profound insight plus some luck, he came up with estimates of climate change that are remarkably close to, to the best estimates we have today. His estimate of five to six degrees equilibrium warming in response to doubling atmospheric CO2 is not quite a factor of two too high based on the present day best estimate of around three degrees. As I said, he's, he was lucky. He made errors that compensated. He made errors of one side because the climate model he used was uh, erroneous and he made uh, partly compensating errors of the other side because his spectroscopy was er erroneous. So the result was that it quantitatively wasn't bad more than 100 years ago. So we had with Tyndall the demonstration that the greenhouse gas is importantly absorbed in the IR, and from Arrhenius the demonstration that, uh, <clears throat> that this could have serious consequences for climate. Arrhenius massively underestimated the rate at which CO2 would in fact increase in the real world. He thought it might take thousands of years to double. He didn't foresee either the explosive growth in population or the rapid increase in the use of fossil fuels to, uh, <clears throat> to produce what is now something like 80% of the world's energy. But nonetheless, he was, he was right on. And mind you, this was before there was any theoretical understanding, before quantum mechanics, so we didn't know why these gases behaved that way. And before any computers, so Arrhenius was doing all this with hand calculations. To, I want to say a little bit in closing about um, a third scientist, Charles David Keeling, who is responsible for this graph, the most famous graph in earth science, showing that CO2 is in fact um, rising. And it was Keeling, of course, who also first demonstrated that it was rising because of, of human causes. Uh, <clears throat> I think of these three scientists together, and I think it's very fitting that this historical lecture series at AGU is going to be named in honor of Arrhenius, because I think that while an enormous amount of work has been done since then, if you trace back the roots of the science that we're all engaged in, these three scientists, <clears throat> Tyndall and Arrhenius and Keeling, hold unique uh, positions in the pantheon of, of uh, climate science. And uh, <clears throat> to summarize their accomplishments very briefly, Tyndall, as we've seen, uh, proved that, that uh, gases absorb infrared heat. We now know that it's the gases with three or more atoms per molecule that do that, but he knew that empirically. Arrhenius demonstrated the sensitivity of climate to the greenhouse gases, and Keeling monitored the change and uh, proved that it's due to human activities. Arrhenius was very definitely a theorist, a very versatile theorist, and Tyndall uh, made measurements in the lab. Keeling made measurements in nature. Both Tyndall and Keeling invented their, their own instruments. Before Tyndall, there was no way for physicists to show that these greenhouse gases absorbed. And before Keeling, there was no way to measure CO2 concentration accurately. I'll say a, a word or two about, um, <clears throat> about Keeling. I knew him very well for the last 25 years of his life. We were colleagues at Scripps in La Jolla. Those are the first few uh, uh, years on the, on the Keeling curve at the bottom left. And the observatory on Mauna Loa uh, is uh, shown at the right where Keeling's instrument was. Keeling was similar in some ways to the impression I've now formed about uh, Tyndall. He was also argumentative, and he wasn't afraid of scientific controversy, and he stood his ground when he believed he was right. Keeling came to Scripps in the late 1950s before he was 30 years old. He was a postdoc, the lowest life form in the academic hierarchy. And uh, the person who brought him to Scripps was Roger Revell who was then the director of Scripps, and who was a scary man. Ravel was six and a half feet tall. He had a commanding presence, a booming voice. He was charismatic. He expected to be listened to and obeyed. He was a very, very impressive guy. And when Keeling came, this is a true story. I'm sure of it, because Keeling and Ravel both told me this same story. 
When he came to Scripps, Ravel said, welcome, young man. We're going to take this instrument you've invented. Now you're an oceanographer. We're going to put it on a ship. We'll drive it around the world, measure CO2 everywhere, come back in 10 years, and see if it has changed. Got that? And Keeling looked at Ravel, the great Ravel, the magisterial Ravel, and said, that's a really stupid idea. <laughs> because Keeling had already made measurements, and he knew that the CO2 concentration for climate purposes didn't vary very much from place to place. It stayed in the atmosphere for so long that the winds mixed it around and homogenized it. It's high in this room because we're all breathing out CO2, but it's not very different over San Francisco than it is over Moscow. And so Keeling prevailed. He convinced Ravel and put the instrument instead where he wanted it, in a pristine location where he could make continuous time series measurements. So I tell uh, young graduate students and postdocs, do not be afraid to differ with your boss. Be sure you're right. <laughs> in closing, I want to just make one more remark. Um, the idea that uh, Tyndall and Arrhenius had had and that was taken up by Guy Stewart Callender and by a few others fell out of favor for what in retrospect are now wrong reasons. People thought, for example, that CO2 once put into the atmosphere would quickly be absorbed into the ocean. And other people thought that the CO2 bands that absorbed in the IR would quickly become saturated. And other people thought that the CO2 bands and the water vapor bands overlapped so much that adding CO2 when there was already a lot of water vapor wouldn't matter very much. And we now know all of those objections were not well founded. And but yet, by mid-century, uh, they had largely been dismissed. And when I went to school in the 1950s, late 1950s, uh, to study meteorology, the, the uh, <coughs> definitive assessment of the time was a book of about the size of the Manhattan phone book put out by the American Meteorological Society called the Compendium of Meteorology. And the compendium had survey articles by leading people of the time. And the, uh, the article on climate change was by the English climatologist Brooks. And he pointed out uh, that uh, <coughs> climate change is for lots of reasons. And CO2 didn't strike him as being a particularly persuasive argument. And so he said in the beginning of the article, this theory is not considered further. And this was a prevalent opinion. This was not an, an outlier opinion of the time. Yet today we know that uh, they were all wrong and that Tyndall and Aridius uh, were right. I think it's helpful, and I say, tell this to reporters, to imagine a slightly different history of the world in which just like the real world, since the 1800s we've been pumping CO2 into the atmosphere, mainly through burning fossil fuels. But suppose that the same humanity that was doing that, which actually happened, also had neglected so far to invent the tools of modern climate science, including satellites and, and supercomputers. So we'd have an alternative planet, planet B, that was warming like the current planet is, for the same reasons that the current planet is, but we wouldn't have the scientific observational or theoretical or modeling tools uh, to understand it. And so the skeptics, the contrarians, those who reject the findings of modern climate science are in effect living on planet B. They're surrounded by, they're living in a climate system which is in fact being profoundly changed because we're adding greenhouse gases and other things to it, but which uh, is not understandable, not to them. And the disinformation campaign that today is devoted to trying to sow confusion and doubt about modern climate science and to uh, undermine the confidence that it deserves um, is really founded on, on this. And I think it's lar very largely policy driven. That is to say, those who deny the reality and seriousness of man-made climate change today are really, although they disguise their views by attacking the science, they are really concerned to about and opposed to policies that they fear might be put in place uh, were the science to become accepted. I'm quite convinced of that. And I'll close with this thought. We sometimes are asked whether climate scientists should be policy advocates. That is to say, do you lose credibility as a scientist if you take off the white coat, so to speak, and go out in public and testify before Congress and talk to the press about uh, policy? And I think John Tyndall would have said yes, and were he alive and working today, I think he would be a very vehement uh, 
and uh, probably a very effective policy advocate. And I've put in here a quote from Sherry Rowland, who's uh, at UC Irvine, who said during the ozone controversy, when with very similar tactics, those like himself, who uh, had shown that uh, ozone depletion was caused by man-made chemicals, were being attacked by the profitable industry that made them. Roland said one day to a reporter, and I've put the source of the quote that was published there, he said, what's the use of having developed a science well enough to make predictions if in the end all we're willing to do is stand around and wait for them to come true? And I've asked Sherry Rowland whether he thinks that's an apt way to characterize uh, global warming or climate change today. And he said, uh, yes, he certainly does. And I think John Tyndall would too. Tyndall uh, is the subject of a conference that I mentioned held in Dublin. The proceedings of the conference are at that website. Tyndall's original paper uh, is uh, on that website. It's very readable today. And I urge all of you who are interested in John Tyndall to learn more about him uh, by going to that link. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, again, we uh, can take a few questions, um, and uh, Steve Lloyd is up here with the microphone. If, uh, if you have some questions, please come forward. Mike Weiner. By the way, Dave Keeling was a graduate of the University of Illinois. That's right. I'm Michael Weiner, Berkeley. Um, did Tyndall look at other gases uh, like oxygen and nitrogen and find uh, that they did not have significant absorptive? Did quality? Tyndall look at other gases? Yes, he did. He was methodical. He worked on this for years. He did uh, oxygen. He did nitrogen. He did methane. He did uh, water vapor. And so he showed before there was a, a, a physical understanding, as I said, before quantum mechanics, which is where the theoretical foundation comes, that molecules with two atoms, oxygen and nitrogen being the big examples that make up almost all of the atmosphere, do not absorb significantly in, in the infrared. And uh, molecules with three or more, like CO2, H2O, do. So Tyndall did both. Um, Steve Easterbrook, the University of Toronto. Um, somebody you didn't mention um, during the talk was calendar, and I've heard an, an argument that we should actually be calling it the calendar effect rather than the greenhouse gas effect. Could you say where he fits in this pantheon? Yes, I, could. I did mention Guy Stewart calendar, uh, but only briefly in passing. Calendar, I think, who was a British steam engineer and who's been uh, written about extensively by uh, Jim Fleming, the outstanding historian of atmospheric science, was in fact an early proponent of this, and he was quite right. I think what Calendar had were, first of all, very imperfect measurements of CO2, that is to say, accurate measurements um, waited for Keeling to invent his instrument. And in fact, if you go back and look at papers in the 1950, early 50s and, late, and earlier, it's clear that the, the measurements being reported of CO2 concentrations were largely due to sampling error. They, they included maps with isolines of CO2 concentration and so on. But Guy Stewart Calendar, I think, was, to my mind, a, a little bit analogous to Wegener. That is to say, he was for a long time regarded as a scientific outlier. He was one of the few proponents in the mid-20th century who, who understood, advocated strongly, did a lot of work on uh, the notion that CO2 would uh, be a determinant of, of climate, but I think he was uh, largely uh, in, a, in a very small minority at that time, whereas the prevalent opinion, as I showed with the Brooks quotation, was that uh, for various reasons CO2 ought not to be a determinant. But I think Callender was absolutely right and, uh, and uh, very much uh, deserves credit. I'm, I don't object at all to calling it the Callender effect. Okay, let's thank Richard one more time, please.